Now for today's program. Natan Sharansky, born in Ukraine, was a spokesman for the human rights movement, a prisoner of Zion, and leader in the struggle for the right of Soviet Jews to immigrate to Israel. After his request to make Aliyah, Mr. Sharansky was arrested on trumped up charges of treason and espionage. He was convicted in a Soviet court and served nine years in the Gulag, with many stretches in a punishing cell. Following massive public campaigns by the State of Israel, world jewelry, and leaders of the free world, Mr. Sharansky was released in 1986, making Aliyah on the very day of his release. In his first few years in Israel, Mr. Sharansky established the Zionist Forum to assist Soviet Olim in their absorption in Israel. In the 1990s, he established the Israel Ba'aliyah Party in order to accelerate the integration of Russian Jews. He served in four successive Israeli governments as minister and deputy prime minister. From 2009 to 2018, Mr. Sharansky served as chairman of the executive of the Jewish Agency for Israel, and in 2018 received the highest Israeli award, the Israel Prize for Promoting Aliyah and the Ingathering of the Exiles. In July 2019, he became chair of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. Mr. Sharansky is the only living non-American citizen who is the recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He is the author of several books, including The Case for Democracy, The Power of Freedom to Overcome Tyranny and Terror. Robert Siegel was the senior host of NPR's award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered, for 30 years. In 2018, he was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Journalism. He's been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association's Silver Gavel Award. Currently, he hosts Navigating the New Abnormal, a series of web seminars sponsored by American Friends of Rabin Medical Center on the JBS, Jewish Broadcasting Service Television Network. Robert is a special literary contributor to Moment Magazine and serves on the advisory board for Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Natan Sharansky and Robert Siegel. And Natan Sharansky, it's good just to, uh, to talk with you once again. Thank you for doing this today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Susan. You, you uh, describe yourself as one of a small group of moralists in Israel who, and I'm, I'm quoting now from your recent article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, who regard Mr. Putin's actions as the ultimate threat to freedom and who urge Israel to join the rest of the civilized world in standing unequivocally against him. Uh, my question is, why is that a minority view in Israel today? Well, first of all, of course, I used moralists with the quoting marks, because I would never uh, call myself seriously moral moralist. Okay. But yes, from the day one, from the first minute of this barbaric aggression, uh, when it was not yet clear how barbaric it is, nevertheless, I urged Israel to take very clear anti-Putin's position uh, because it's a challenge not only to Ukraine, but the basic principles on which uh, free world is standing. Uh, and the argument which I heard and which I hear and which most Israelis share that we, not, it wasn't our will, but it was the weakness, unfortunately, of Americans, which permitted to, to Putin to not only to create a military base, but in fact to control fully the skies of Syria. So not only we have now border with the military of Russia, but we also now have practically every night to attack Iranian positions in Syria, uh, which was financed mainly after the agreements with Iran. And in order to attack these positions, we need permission of uh, Putin. That's unfortunately strategic understanding, which exists already for the last six or seven years. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that we are so dependent on Putin and that yes, he made it clear, the moment we are giving our weapons to Ukraine, he is giving no. the to Syria and permits the article that he wrote in the in the Wall Street Journal uh, 
said that when Barack Obama uh, declared that the use of chemical weapons in, in uh, Syria would be a red line uh, against which if Syria crossed it, there would be serious consequences, but then did not respond militarily uh, to that action. Uh, Natan argues uh, that um, uh, the, the weakness of the United States at that moment permitted Russia to establish its position in Syria. Uh, and uh, its position in Syria uh, permits it to, uh, gives it control over what positions uh, Israel can strike at, and Israel has many uh, Iranian and pro-Iranian targets uh, in Syria. Yeah. Uh, you're back with us. I've, I've summarized yeah, your article right no. now from the Wall Street Journal while you were Yeah, while I'm you were sorry, in the dark. but I, now I have to speak from my iPhone because we have such a weather in Jerusalem that there are interruptions. So Okay, uh, well, as I'll I say, well... Okay. While the line wasn't there, I summarized your, I very, very loyally, okay. very okay. accurately summarized your article in the Wall okay. Street Journal. And, but, and if, if, if I hear you right, you're saying uh, uh, you acknowledge there are real security concerns, but you wish that uh, a Not moral really. I, judgment. I, would, I appeal to our government that they must take very clear position. Uh, we are with, in this, we are with Ukraine and with the free world against uh, this evil attempt to, in fact, not only to destroy Ukraine, but to blackmail and frighten all the free world and to change the rules uh, of the game. Uh, but I have to say, ex expecting it from my government, I also expect from uh, American government and from NATO, in these moments when we see just the last picture, which I saw only a few minutes ago on CNN and Fox, that yes, America has to stop this ping pong with the airplanes and to send airplanes. You say send airplanes, we have to send anti-airplanes anti uh, uh, weapons, okay? But the US, the US is, I mean, I heard a, an, an American journalist, uh, David Ignatius, describing what he saw over the weekend traveling with the uh, U.S. Yeah. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, seeing the uh, Stinger and uh, Javelin yeah. missiles being rushed into Ukraine in great quantity, uh, uh, NATO is is supplying a lot of weaponry. There, there are other questions about whether it made any sense yeah. for Poland to contribute MIG. So, but you you think the U.S. should be doing? I, I think should, look, should be doing I more. also can say we Israelis at this moment are sending a lot of doctors and taking children to our hospitals and sending medicines and it's not enough. It's not enough. At this moment, you see what's happening in Ukraine. You will probably hear the president of, of uh, Zelensky, who is a, a surprisingly inspiring figure this moment. And he says, close the skies. And uh, I think that's, uh, and the answer is, we are too afraid to provocate Putin. If there is a danger of the Third World War. And that is the biggest success of uh, Putin, that he really, he understood he doesn't have enough strength, but he has, uh, he can uh, threaten with the things which with the others are not ready to, to threaten. And that's created the problem that world is, is, of course, with Ukraine, we all want to support, but at the same time, we are paralyzed by the fear to provocate Putin uh, too much, and that's why there are limits to which we are ready to help to Ukraine in these very critical moments. In a few days, we can have tens of thousands killed. We can have the, to see the absolutely destroyed European cities uh, in Ukraine, and we will be all praying and speaking how much we want to help. Close the sky, that's what I'm saying. Close the skies. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the the reaction to that uh, from the U.S. government is that yeah. that would in fact uh, as, as make this a war between NATO yeah, well, and 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 uh, Russia. Uh, as long war. as long as long as uh, the the world doesn't demonstrate the same readiness to go to war as Putin demonstrates, there is a big danger of the war. The only yeah. way to prevent this danger is to show to Putin that the West is as determined and as ready to fight as he is ready. That's why small, modest experience 
in criminal world and Putin behaves exactly as criminal, as a ringleader in the cell. A ringleader is not the one who is physically more strong, but the one who shows that he is ready to use his force, his knife, any moment. And Putin demonstrates it. The world has to respond uh, with the readiness to fight with him. And uh, at the meantime, uh, there is agony of Ukrainian people. You, you, you've described the reasoning behind uh, the Israeli position uh, on, on the war in Ukraine. I'm wondering if we could just, if you could just define what that, what that official policy is. Is Israel neutral over the uh, invasion of Ukraine right now? Uh, no, you can't say that Israel is uh, neutral again. I'm critical of the position, but Israel from day two, let's say, if not from the day one, when do sends one after another airplanes of humanitarian help, of the medical concerns, of everything what is needed. Our, uh, many of our workers are there on the borders of the four countries helping to many refugees. Uh, we send and uh, start the special hospital. We take mm -hmm. some of the uh, wounded children uh, to us. And at the same time, we are trying, or at least we think that we are trying, because I don't believe in this, uh, to, uh, as a, one of few countries who speaks to both uh, sides in a very friendly manner, we are trying to negotiate. Personally, I don't believe that we can play any essential role in these negotiations, and I am not happy to see my prime minister sitting, uh, sh uh, sh shaking hands with Putin and telling that he is speaks rationally yeah well we'll we'll, we'll get to uh, uh, to what what might be mediated in this in a, in a few minutes but I just wanted to first dispense with with uh, the US Israeli differences over over Ukraine as, as I summarized while you were in the dark there uh, you attribute much of the problem here that uh, uh, Israel faces in Syria to the weakness of Barack Obama uh, I've also heard the former US ambassador, uh, to Ukraine, uh, Marie Jovanovich, uh, say that the notorious Trump-Zelensky telephone call that got Donald Trump impeached the first time uh, also showed Putin that uh, the U.S. wasn't serious about Ukraine. It was a place where you could uh, trade some weapons for dirt on, uh, on a political opponent's son, uh, and that Putin felt emboldened uh, by the lack of seriousness that President Trump showed toward the Ukrainian issue. Would you would you accept that as one uh, of yeah, contributing uh, I would accept it. Absolutely. Look, I don't have much. Uh, I can say a lot of good uh, words about some of the Trump's steps uh, for Israel mm -hmm. uh, and deal with uh, Iran, one of them, and moving uh, to Jerusalem, another. But I uh, don't have much anything good to say about Trump's dealing with dictatorships and Trump's friendly attitude to Putin or to Korean dictator. But the thing is that it, uh, it is only after unbelievable, unbelievable weakness demonstrated by American administration putting the red line by themselves, putting the red line yeah. to Syrians using chemical weapons and then refusing to cross it, that after this Putin did two things which unite us in this conflict. They, uh, they made brought their forces to Syria and created a powerful military base. And they started the war against Ukraine by occupying uh, Crimea. And yes, after this, uh, all American administrations didn't show much readiness to, to fight against, uh, against aggression uh, in Ukraine. But again, we, Look, we, we can speak about the past. Yeah. The situation is immediate today, what we are doing today. Yes. And I have to say, uh, my, uh, my criticism to Israel is strong only because I'm Israeli. But if I were American, I would be first of all critical and demanding from American government uh, what to do at this very moment. Some people uh, may not know that you grew up uh, in uh, the eastern Ukrainian city uh, now called either Donetsk or Donetsk. When I was there th for one day, they called it Donetsk in, in, in Russian. Nice. Uh, you grew up Jewish, uh, speaking Russian, studying uh, Ukrainian in school. 
Uh, Donetsk is, is in one of the breakaway regions in the east of, of Ukraine. Actually, we never, we can put up a map. Uh, Suzanne Borden has one just to help people uh, see what Ukraine looks like. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it, well, there, I guess it would be north of the Sea of, of Azov. It's not, uh, not quite yeah. marked out there. Uh, bordering Russia. Very, it's a Russified part of, 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 of Ukraine. Um, should, I'm, I'm asking now as we think about what it is that people want to negotiate about, uh, what they want to uh, gain from peace talks, uh, should a Russian withdrawal from the Donbass and from Luhansk near it, or from Crimea, should those be uh, conditions uh, of peace, or should these be items that are on the table and under discussion, some of which may have to be conceded to Russia, and wouldn't that be a, a, a victory for aggression if, in fact, uh, you had to give up, uh, you had to give up Donetsk, the Donbas region, in order to achieve peace? Well, you know, we are sitting and negotiating with ourselves. Yes. But, uh, but Putin made it very clear in his long 45 minutes speech, which I had patience uh, to listen from the first and the last word, and which is a very interesting speech. He said it very frankly. He said, Ukraine is not a real state. It's fiction. Uh, Ukrainian people are not real people. It's part of Russian people. Uh, and uh, uh, we, are, we have, and he believes that his historical mission, to bring Ukrainians back. He said there are 40 million Russian people living around, he wants to bring all of them back together with the territories on which they, they live. And of course, he had a good pretext. First, his first pretext was Crimea. And he explained why historically it's Russian territory. And what he did in the meantime, he built in Crimea huge military base from which he is now attacking southern Ukraine. At the same time, he started the revolt, so-called revolt in Donetsk. I, I was born in Donetsk, then it was called Stalino. I lived oh, yes. there for the first 18 years of my life. I know it is really very international place, Donbass. Why? Because it was the biggest industrial center, not only in Ukraine, in the Russian Empire. It was and a coal mining center also. The, coal, the main coal was from there. All my childhood was among coal mines. And so from all the villages, from Siberia and from Belarus and from Moscow, from all the villages, when there was hunger, people were coming to look for work in uh, Donbass. So when I lived there, there were a lot of Russians and a lot, of course a lot of Ukrainians and Kazakhs and Armenians. And, uh, but uh, and there was no doubt that it's part of Ukraine. In fact, the biggest celebration, what I remember in my childhood, when I was five years old, Stalin died. When I was six years old, big celebration, 300 years of unity between Ukraine and Russia, how Bogdan Khmelnytsky voluntarily brought Ukraine to Russia, and, and everybody studied Russian and Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and uh, well, my, my first language was Russian, my second was Ukrainian, but of course, as every Jew, we tried to be the best in every field that we are studying, so we tried to be the best also in the Ukrainian. And by the way, Ukraine has very interesting literature, very yes. interesting art, and it's on rather tragic and problematic from our Jewish point of view. But, uh, but, but Natan, that, that very uh, famous 300th birthday of the uh, of, of, of yeah. the Ukrainian... Uh, well, the real, uh, that, the dearly, yes. This it's was also the Ukraine. moment yeah. Nikita yeah. Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, took the occasion to move yeah. Crimea, as I understand it, out yeah. of the yeah. Russian Republic into the Ukrainian Republic. Uh, a Soviet Republic, uh, a place where many indigenous uh, people, the uh, Crimean Tatars, they'd been banished uh, by Stalin to Central Asia, I think, for collaboration during the war. Is, is Crimea the weakest claim of, of all the territories in dispute? Is Crimea Ukraine's weakest claim given its history? Yeah, yeah. I will say, if you look historically, Crimea is the strongest claim of Russia mm -hmm. because of the history of the war against France, against Britain, a lot of uh, heroes uh, come from there. But in fact, if you look, look at the history, the, those who have the real strong claim on Crimea is Tatars. Yes. Because it was 
the center of Tatars for many centuries, and then Ekaterina the Great, when it conquered, when they conquered Crimea, they sent in exile all the elite, all the nobles and so on. And then Stalin, in order to make sure that Tatars will never start demanding it back, sent half of the people to Siberia. Okay, if you look at the borders, Crimea is fully the only republic which so commenced it's Ukraine. So it was natural in the Soviet Union to say, okay, uh, we were fighting, uh, uh, Tatars think that there's, there's we're, let's, let's give it to, to Ukraine. So when Putin took uh, Crimea, I have to say, it added him popularity in Russia because in, in the, the minds of many Russians, he had a case. But today, and, uh, and he immediately continued with, in, in, uh, with sending some elements to Donbass, to Donetsk and Lugansk, mm -hmm. for eight years it's already continued. But today, I think nobody in Russia can really understand why, uh, uh, why we have to fight and to be, why our soldiers have to be killed. Because, uh, because and by the way, uh, 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 Putin's propaganda, it isolated Russia from all the informational channels. You can't yes. see today CNN or Fox or read any dissident uh, uh, article. So they, uh, propaganda says there is no war. We simply sent small group of support because there were refugees from Donbass. There is catastrophe in Donbass and we have to help them. So everybody who knows what's happening in this moment in Ukraine, he goes after all Ukraine. He's ready to destroy it. He, he's very upset that he didn't succeed in three days and, yes. uh, to get it. And uh, at, at the same time, he's challenging all the, all, all the order, all the agreements, all the understanding that you cannot take by force, deprive any people in Europe of their freedom. Uh, and uh, it is, if, if he will not be stopped in Ukraine, he will have to be stopped in some other place. And if you, it will not be clear that the free world is ready to fight with him. Yes, uh, but uh, but I guess my my question. I, I don't want to belabor it too long. But yeah. do you do you think that stopping Putin in Ukraine means complete withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukrainian soil and the return or the 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 uh, 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 withdrawing the claim to the Donbas, Luhansk, and Crimean uh, areas? Okay. Uh, you know, it is important that he will understand, he will f see that while be, be, uh, be fighting in Ukraine, it that does make him stronger, it makes him weaker with every day. And for the, so uh, resistance in Ukraine on one hand, sanctions on the other. If, if somebody thinks that now, when he did already, he will be satisfied with something less than turning Ukraine in, uh, in his puppet, in one or another way. Uh, mm. You can say, okay, these parts of Ukraine will be independent, these parts of the Ukraine will be mine, and these parts of the Ukraine will be de uh, uh, demilitarized and uh, to make sure that they, they were fully, will be fully dependent. I think it is very important that he will understand that he cannot speak by force with the free world. And at this moment, he believes that maybe he's not the strongest person in the world, but he's the only one who can frighten the world. Yes. And, uh, and that's why it is very important to respond. You, you, you mentioned, uh, oddly, that, uh, uh, not oddly, but you mentioned that when, when the 300th anniversary was celebrated, when you were a little kid, statue went up to Bodan Khmelnytsky, who had been the Ukrainian leader, yeah. uh, uh, to you know, Jews who, who remember the history of the Jewish people in that part of the world. Uh, until Hitler, I believe, Hel Khmelnytsky was the most, uh, the worst genocidal uh, uh, enemy of the Jews uh, uh, ever. Uh, the pogroms under him were, were devastating to the Jewish community. Flashing forward to the 21st century, what's happening now between Russia and Ukraine, is there, any, is there the slightest uh, degree of anti-Semitism on either side of this fight? Yes. You know, I, uh, uh, I work a lot, uh, worked in the last 30, 30 years, yeah, with uh, the leaders of Ukraine and the leaders of Russia, including Zelensky and including Putin, 
Uh, well, it was Putin, the, my last meeting was 12 years ago, but uh, the Zelensky, I worked very close now on YBR in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, in the last eight years, there was a number of times when Russian ambassador was coming and saying, you have to condemn anti-Semitism in Ukraine. And Ukrainian ambassador was coming to me and saying, you have to condemn anti-Semitism in Russia. And I was telling them both that they are wrong. I understand that they are in the war, but they are wrong. There is no anti-Semitism. There is no state anti-Semitism in Ukraine and no state anti-Semitism in Russia. And I would say even today, with this awful thing which are happening, today, Jew with kippah and uh, or, uh, ultra orthodox Jew can go in the streets of Moscow or Kiev or, Kiev, uh, the, or any Ukrainian city, yeah. feeling himself or herself more safe than when they're doing it in Paris. So Paris, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is no, uh, maybe it is difficult for Jews to accept, this is not conflict around about Jews. As to the anti-Semitism of Bogdan Pinitsko, of course, yeah. awful figure in our history. And each time when I was in Ukraine, in the, the, uh, the hotel going to meet uh, some Jews or the leaders of Ukraine and see this monument of Bogdan Pinitsky, uh, uh, I'm bewildered. But then yeah. when I speak to Ukrainian leaders, they say, look, uh, uh, there is monument to him not because of these pogroms. Of course, we are we uh, condemn it. There's monument to him because he was liberator of Ukraine from... From Poland. From, yeah. uh, well, and you know what? I'm yeah. coming as a tourist to Spain, and I see there uh, the monument to king and queen was Ferdinand and, uh, and, and uh, Isabella, uh, yes. Isabella. Yes. And there are their monuments in Madrid and uh, I think in uh, Sevilla and other places. And we are not stopping our diplomatic relations with Spain. Yes. We are not, uh, and uh, with Ukraine, what is very important, and, and with Russia and with yes. any other nation, that they will recognize the, the tragedy of those pages and that we will make everything together that there will be no anti-Semitism in the future. That's exactly what we are doing now with Ukrainian government and Babi Yar. Yeah. And that's exactly what we are trying to do also in many places with the Russian government. Among the oligarchs uh, considered close to Putin and targeted uh, with sanctions, uh, there are Jews, uh, some of whom have strong ties, if not dual citizenship uh, with Israel. Uh, should Israel, like the United Arab Emirates, uh, as I've read in today's New York Times, uh, become a haven for individuals or companies that are under sanction and say, well, this person, uh, uh, he may also he may be a Russian, but he's also an Israeli citizen and uh, uh, we, we, won't, uh, we won't try to, uh, we won't take part in any uh, confiscation of his property. Well, uh, first of all, you said among oligarchs are some Jews. I would say among oligarchs, there are some non-Jews. Yes. Uh, yes. And... Uh, 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 <laughs> you mean, no, you're I, saying that the oligarchs are there, there are several well, many of them are, and many of them are Jewish. Take yes. into account how all these oligarchs appeared, you'll understand why because uh, the Soviet Union was falling apart and the economy was absolutely ineffective. And uh, so, those, uh, those who knew what to do with this, how to take this state uh, factory and connect it with some Western markets. And uh, there were many Jews among those people who were the first to do it. And some of them became oligarchs. No, as far as I know, Israel is not going to become the heaven. But the, of course, Israel has an obligation to give citizenship to every Jew who wants uh, uh, to get citizenship if he or she is not a uh, criminal. Even oligarchs, when there are sanctions against them, they're not declared to be criminals. They, they can continue living in London or in other places where they live. They are, they are restricted in their opportunities to use the money. They don't have access to their money, to their capitals. But so, of course, if some of them would like to take Israeli citizens, they can take. Whether they, are, they can hide their property in Israel? No, I don't think so. I, don't, I think Israel will cooperate. Uh, fully with, uh, with, us, with the free world of this. By the way, for example, today uh, uh, England, England put on sanctions Abramovich, Abramovich. and yeah. immediately uh, Yad Vashem 
stopped the agreement which they had with Abramovich about some big donation which he gave a few weeks ago. This is Roman Abramovich who, who owns Roman. Chelsea. Yeah, and, uh, again, Chelsea I have to say that everybody has the right, every citizen has the right for free, for uh, honest trial. So I hope uh, uh, the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the banks or whatever are restricted uh, or closed or uh, disconnected from SWIFT doesn't mean that any of them will be brought on trial without trial. So I, I hope there will be time to, to check uh, every step and everything. But in the meantime, uh, we are in the war. The, uh, the free world, as part of their sanctions, takes also these sanctions. So uh, uh, I hope there will be some clear criteria which are applied. And this, of course, has to follow. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about uh, your appeal to Israel to let... Uh, morality override what you see as valid security uh, concerns in Syria. And yeah. I've been thinking especially about how important the idea of individual moral agency has been to you uh, over the years. You've, you've written about uh, the, the, the free society versus the fear society. If I, uh, if I enter the public, if I'm free to go to the public square and voice my, my opinions uh, without fear of being beaten or arrested, I'm in a free society. If, okay. if I'm going to get beaten or arrested, I'm, I'm in, a, in a fear society. Uh, and those are important ideas to you. Uh, and while you use the word moralist at the beginning, you said you use it in quotations, uh, you, you, the idea that we are moral actors is something that I, that I associate with your, with your approach to, to public life. And it seems to me it must be uh, to, to see these security concerns uh, held so high above the moral claim that Ukraine's cause has on, on Israel. It, it must be very disappointing to you. It must be uh, uh, painful to you at some level. You know, you know uh, I try to prove in my book, The Case of Democracy, that uh, moral position in the end is also the, the most pragmatical position. And here in this case, for sure, look, if that is the case, of destruction of state of Israel. It is one of the people on uh, interviewing me said, you speak about the moral obligation. The first moral obligation of Israeli government is to guarantee that Israel will not be uh, erased, destroyed. I, do you agree? I said, yeah, it's not only moral, uh, for this Israel exists. And he said, so if the threat is that we will be destroyed, and Iran every day says that we will be destroyed, and he puts, uh, 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 new and new bases, and we have to attack them uh, almost every night, and we will not be able to attack them. Is not the uh, uh, the top priority? So I agree. By the way, that is top priority. But what I'm saying also that this conflict, uh, the fact that Putin has good, uh, really unique in Russian history, so, so Russian leader has good attitude to Jews, yes. But the fact that. He, he has much bigger interest or much bigger mission in, the, in, the, uh, in this world to restore uh, yeah. Russian empire. He will not stop, as he himself explains, he, he, nobody will stop. Him. So he is trying to change the very nature of the free world. And uh, Israel wants to exist as a part of free world. Israel and Israelis don't want to live uh, uh, on the mercy of some dictator. And uh, he will be dictating our, our life. So it is our very important, also pragmatic interest that the free world will uh, will defeat. Not only, we, of course, we morally feel sympathetic, and I have to say, in Israel, it's uh, uh, amazing campaign of support, and many young people simply all the time are looking where are the needs, how to send another one hundred shekels. Uh, uh, for this person, that person in Ukraine, and there is a, a lot of moral sympathy. But what I'm thinking, if we'll speak only about morals, then people yeah. say, okay, uh, we have individual moral sympathy, but we have interest not to destroy our state. But now we're speaking about the war against all the free world, including our state, and that's why we have to, yes, uh, but we have to say to America, we want to fight together with you against Putin in Ukraine, but we want you together with us to fight against Putin's base in the Middle East. 
for I have one more question for you before I turn to questions from from the audience. Uh, and my question is this: When you were when you were writing twenty years ago about democracy, yeah. uh, you dismissed the idea that some some places, some countries, Arab states, Russia. Uh, are not fertile ground for democracy. Forget about it in those countries. You were much more optimistic yeah. about our capacity for, for, for de democracy in, in all sorts of countries. In the years since, having seen the coming and the crushing of the Arab Spring, having seen Vladimir Putin go from a, a kind of a, a, an anti-corruption, young anti-corruption fighter in charge of the uh, chaotic uh, uh, state that Russia had fallen into, uh, turn into an autocrat who's now trying to restore the old borders of the, uh, of, of the Soviet Union, it seems. Uh, have, have you rethought, have you changed your position at all? Perhaps, I mean, is there something missing in Russian history, uh, some development of a middle class or some experience of the enlightenment? Is there, is, is there some development of a legal tradition like the English common law? something that hasn't happened in Syria or Egypt or Russia okay. that in fact handicaps those countries in trying to become democratic. Uh, you know, my book, The Case for Democracy, had to be called, initially, we called it The Case for Freedom. And our editor, whom you also know very well, insisted that the case for freedom sounds too abstract. Let's call it the case for democracy. So yes. if you ask me what I would change if I was writing the book, I would write absolutely the same. And I propose you to go back and to read how actual in fact it is, but okay. I would insist on the title, the case of freedom, because I never say that, that everybody wants an English type democracy or American type democracy or three branches of power. What I'm we are trying to show from my experience that all the people who live under dictatorship want to get rid of this life of fear and the life of double thinking. And from this point, the Arab Spring was one of the mo most optimistic proofs of what I'm writing. Because if you look on people in Egypt or in Yemen, what they were or in Libya, what they were writing, how they were liberated, how they felt themselves, and how they decided to fight for their freedom. It's absolutely the same process which I describe in the book. But in that right. book, I also describe that free elections after this, it's not freedom, only free society. Yeah. Uh, and there is a long uh, way to this. And no doubt that Putin took back most of the freedoms and in these days, he really brings it back to this, uh, to, to, this day, to the Iron Curtain uh, of Soviet Union. Yes, yes. No, in fact, but, I, but, I, I, but, but, we, but, but on the next, but the, the next effort of Russian people to live in more freedom will be much more supported than our freedom. It will be not simply a small group of dissidents. It will be already millions of people who want back to live in a, without fear. Uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to put some questions to you now that our listeners and viewers yeah. have submitted. First, th this is a question that was, that was uh, submitted uh, before we began, along with the registration. Uh, can the Russian oligarchs have any positive influence uh, to stop Putin's madness in Ukraine? The question says. Well, frankly, I think uh, the, uh, the world is greatly overestimates the power of oligarchs. In fact, I would say even more. The oligarchs don't have any influence on the political uh, thinking of Putin, but today I think almost nobody has. It's, it's interesting how Putin, uh, uh, no, nobody in Russia really knows what's happening in, in the head of Putin. Uh, we can only hope that Putin himself knows. What really can influence on him is the feeling that he is not the strongest political leader in the world. And at this moment, he feels that he's the only one who was for 20 years of power. He's the only one who is guaranteed that he will be the next 20 years of power. And he's the only one who's ready to threaten the world with the nuclear weapons. Oligarchy cannot help us. Uh, uh, but well, the pressure from outside and the sanctions for a long time, that can help. Uh, Julia Mendelow uh, has submitted this question. 
what do you believe are the risks that Putin will initiate biological warfare? Well, I, I think, he, uh, I don't think he will do it, but I think that exactly as he threatens with nuclear weapons without, of course, uh, intention to use it, and he sees that it works, uh, that's the same as this. He wants that people will know that he is a madman who can do everything if you will irritate him too much. And, and he wants that the West will feel that there are limits to which we can test uh, him. Uh, as, hello? Yeah, you're back. Hello? Yes. yes. Uh, yes. Uh, well, that's, that's my answer, yeah. Yes, I guess this is really a very similar question. <clears throat> do you think, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee, <clears throat> do you think Putin is bluffing when he uh, threatens nuclear escalation? Uh, he has shown he's willing to become uh, a, uh, a, to bomb a, ch a children's hospital. Uh, isn't it likely that he would be willing to go nuclear uh, if the US, NATO, uh, and NATO were to engage directly? Well, look, uh, he knows that this, uh, no, he is bluffing, but he knows that this bluff works. And when he is uh, preparing his nuclear weapons and tests his nuclear weapons before he enters Ukraine, and America in response is canceling their, uh, their tests of nuclear weapons, which were uh, 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 planned for a year in advance, that's for him a sign that he can continue uh, blackmailing with nuclear weapons uh, in his next demands. I personally believe that his next demands after he'll finish with Ukraine will be take off your sanctions because it is war against me or otherwise I'll be ready to start non-conventional war against you and so on. So I think the sooner America will show that it is that its nuclear weapons uh, are as ready as his and their missiles are closer to Moscow than he is to Washington, the less is the chance that there will be the war. Because he definitely doesn't want uh, self -destruct, mutual self-destruction. He's not Iranian leader who wants uh, to get prize in the next world. He wants to lead in this world. He, so yes, he's bluffing, but his bluff works. And as long as it works, he will continue doing it. Okay. Uh, another attendee asks uh, and pre-submitted this question, uh, what to do about the Iran deal now? What should be done about the Iran deal? Well, that's uh, my criticism of my government, that it didn't put it as a real danger to Israel in the way in which we did it first time. Because uh, what it really means, I look, I never argued in the first deal whether it is, uh, prevents us from nuclear weapons in Iran or not. I always argued that it cannot be that a dictator who swears to our destruction will be getting billions and billions of dollars. That would happen the first time when the deal was signed. He got in cash billions of dollars and puts some of them immediately into fighting against Israel and Hezbollah and so on. And now we are on the eve of signing agreement just as the free world is fighting against Putin. Iran will get billions of dollars without any linking this money to, to his fight for the destruction of Israel. That is the big danger for the free world. And I think this war which we are involved now has to emphasize how it is important that this deal will be linked to, to the terrorist threats which are coming from Iran. And the fact that it is not linked, and the fact that the West is uh, dying to sign together with Putin agreement with Iran, which has no limits on Iranian uh, use of this money for terror activity against us, that's very, very problematic. Okay. Here's a question submitted by, forgive me, I'm not sure how to pronounce, Aya or Aya Johnson. Uh, what is the end game if Putin continues uh, it will continue, uh, uh, it will be, he says, or she says, I'm not sure, uh, it will continue, it will be genocide. What, what do you think the end game of all this is? How do you think it Well, look, it concludes? Uh, I think that Putin now watches very carefully what's happening and the message which he's unfortunately getting to himself 
that of course he was surprised that Ukrainians are fighting so hard. He said they are not a nation. He made them more central for the world as a nation than anywhere in their history. He is surprised by the solidarity of the, uh, 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 sanctions, but he sees that his <coughs> blackmail or uh, threat about nuclear war, uh, war is working, that the West watches this awful tragedy of destroying Kharkov and Mariupol, and now in the beginning of destruction of Kyiv, and is not ready to fight. And that I think gives him a lot of encouragement that he can continue after this. His aim is to rebuild uh, Russian empire, to make it the strongest uh, country in the world. And he has many challenges. He has to stop these awful sanctions, as he believes, which is war against me. And he has, he has Poland, he has Mol Moldavia. What can stop him? If he sees that the West is ready to fight, that he will not be able to succeed military in, yeah. in Ukraine or, or, or for, to, to read this. And, and that the fact, the fact that he is becoming paria, he is becoming absolutely lonely in the world, and there is no hope that the world will change position. He hopes but, that but, the but, world will change in another month. Yeah, but Natan, isn't there a fairly clear line, fairly clear, bold line that uh, President Biden and European leaders have restated time and time again, which is an attack against any NATO member is an attack against all sure. NATO members. Uh, Ukraine, first of all, for some years was divided about on the virtues of, of being a NATO member. And uh, there was very little progress toward NATO of, of ever absorbing Ukraine. But there's no question about Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, uh, and um, Poland and Hungary and so on. Uh, why, why, why there is no question? Look, could you imagine, could you imagine two months ago that uh, Putin can go and bombard the cities in the Eastern Europe, which are not members of the, of the, of, uh, uh, of the European Union, and tens of thousands of people will be killed and we are really faced. And the, West will not fight. Put, no, simply nobody would think that uh, Putin will dare to do it. But before he did it, he made sure that uh, the West is frightened enough. Now, you say uh, there are very strong statements. I agree. But so as a result of these statements, did America move their tactical nuclear weapons to Poland? What America did? America moved 3,000 soldiers to Poland. Well, you think that's the consideration which will uh, stop Putin at that moment? Okay, though he'll decide at this moment, oh, not no, Poland. Right. But that time, I, 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 th I think it was Viscount Montgomery, if I have my history right, who yeah. said when asked, yeah. how many troops uh, uh, should the West have yeah. in West Berlin? I think he yeah. was, the, I think it was he who said, one is enough. Uh, one is enough. Yeah. Uh, so long as, as they know that any attack on that one soldier uh, is, is exactly. that as, as long as as long as he knows it i don't i yeah. don't think i think that uh he considers that people are frightened he has yeah. to show determination no he will not go immediately as he did with ukraine he didn't go immediately but he will so first build a case look uh we are threatened first of all he has to explain as, as he explained with ukraine that we feel ourselves threatened and many people repeat that if you would, uh, this regime is becoming so anti-Russian, he's so dangerous. To us, so he'll start speaking it about uh, Poland and he will not debunk all the Poland, he, but he will say, look, uh, we want that uh, this part of Poland will be demilitarized. Otherwise, we are so threatened that we will use our nuclear weapons. Yes. But as we see today, uh, it will take time. But uh, the, the, the West will start giving up. Definitely about Moldova, definitely about economical sanctions. He now believes that if this world, which is so uh, uh, feeling uh, responsive to human suffering, watches what's happening and saying one after another, every minute they see another explanation, CNN or Fox, why America cannot give close, uh, close the skies. So in, let's say in the next two weeks, another 50,000 people will be, uh, will be killed. And the, uh, the cities will be fully destroyed. 
And America will be, continue to explain why we cannot provoke Putin. For him, it is the best proof that he can go further. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to read you a question submitted by, um, uh, by Deborah Glazer, because she evidently, like me, she is, she is uh, uh, aware of this peculiarity. She writes, I understand that in 1945, at the creation of the UN, the USSR insisted that Belarus and Ukraine Belarusia and Ukraine as well as then, uh, be admitted as separate nations to the UN in order to increase USSR voting uh, power. Doesn't that indicate that the USSR did in fact view these two states as separate territories, uh, even though they may have been quote puppet states? I think puppet, I think that's giving, that's insulting puppets to say they were puppet states. Uh, Ukraine and Belarusia had ambassadors yeah. to, uh, to the United yeah. Nations. Well, but... it, it, does, it does matter. Every, everybody knew that uh, they are voting all together with uh, with the Soviet Union. Yeah. yeah. And it's like today Putin can demand that he will not agree to continue United Nations if Chechens and Abkhazians are not represented there uh, with their vote. So uh, that, at that moment, the West felt that that's the minimum which we can give to Stalin because, after all, he is one of the winning powers. And he said, you have uh, USA, France, and, uh, whatever, in yeah. Britain, so, and I have only myself. So I'm poor, give me two more voices. They decided to give. There was no meaning. Yeah. An American, uh, uh, a former American diplomat who was on this forum for, with me uh, a week ago, uh, uh, Ivo Dalder uh, pointed out that uh, in, today uh, Vladim uh, Vladimir Putin's power over the the Russian state is not mediated by uh, say even reporting to a politburo, which 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 communist leaders uh, used to do. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I read recently that uh, one of the reasons Khrushchev gave the Crimea to Ukraine was he had to he had to bolster his position with the Ukrainian party to to try to stay in uh, to, try, to try to stay uh, the leader. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. And we talk about oligarchs, but the oligarchs have largely been created by the state uh, to, to a great extent. Um, is do you think that Putin is a more of an autocrat, uh, controlling more, uh, controlling Russia more thoroughly today, than the Brezhnevs and the the, the people yeah. who were well, in charge in, when you were in, when you were a prisoner of conscience? Yeah, you know what? Some time ago, like a year ago or two years ago, I started hearing from Moscow dissidents, from Moscow human rights activists, mm -hmm. that this regime even worse than Brezhnev's because here only one person is deciding. And uh, one even said to me then, and uh, I was surprised, I thought it's an exaggeration, but now it sounds right. That, that then KGB was something that even Politburo was afraid. Well, uh, as you know, in the times of Stalin, KGB became very dependent. And uh, in fact, they, they had to pass different laws which protect them from the power of KGB. Today, there is absolutely no difference between K Putin is KGB and Putin is political leadership. So mm -hmm. from this point, uh, when I, I was first told it a year ago, I thought it's a little bit of exaggeration, but I think it was right. By the way, all these uh, human rights activists uh, who were then speaking, and I was telling them the very fact that you can say what you say and publish it in the uh, press and put it on the internet proves that it's not yet the same regime. Yeah. But today they are all silent. All their newspapers are closed. At this moment, in the last week, uh, Russia put more restrictions on freedom of press than uh, existed, I think, in the times of Russia. Including a, a very important radio station called Echo Moskvi, which uh, Echo Moskvi, someone yeah. worked yeah. in radio for my life. Uh, I feel there's yeah. some, uh, some uh, fraternal relationship there. Uh, and Natan Sharansky, I want to, it's, it's always, it's always incredibly interesting to talk with you and it's, it's uh, good to talk once again. And I want to thank you for, uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to hand things back to uh, Suzanne Borden.
Yes, thank you, Robert, and thank you, Natan. Uh, really, thank you for sharing your own experiences with us. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Uh, we're very grateful that you had the time for us today. I want to thank our audience for joining us and to remind you to go to momentmag.com where we have uh, many more articles um, about the people of Ukraine and the situation that's going on. I know a lot of people have asked if this program will be available later. Uh, it will be on our website by tomorrow morning, if not sooner, and we encourage you to share it with others. Again, Natan, Robert, thank you, and we'll see everybody sure. next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.